Okay. Great. Okay, I'm going to start and hopefully they come in. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, happy Wednesday. On today's stated, I hope you had a good vacation. Good. Uh, on today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following land use items. Uh, Douglas and Parkway, which is an affordable housing resident for seniors in council member Valone's district, 570 Fulton Street in majority leader Lloyd Cumbo's district, more affordable housing. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a hotel development. Uh, Williams Bridge rezoning in council member Jonai's district uh, for affordable housing. Betances V1, it's a NYCHA application in council member Ayala's district. And we're gonna vote on the following three article 11 property tax exemptions. 6769 St. Nicholas Avenue in council member Perkins's district. 3234 Putnam Cluster in council member majority leader Cumbo's district. It's also in uh, Council Member Cornegie's district and East Village Homes in Council Member Rivera's district. The council will vote on a home rule message sponsored by Council Member uh, Andy Cohen that would authorize the state legislature to pass a bill that would allow the city to deploy up to 750 speed limit enforcement cameras in school safety zones across the city. Speed cameras have been shown to significantly slow vehicular speeds and save lives. And this bill would improve the city's ability to collect fines for speed zone violations. You remember last summer we had to come back and do sort of a jerry-rigged fix uh, because the legislature wasn't able to act before the end of last legislative session. Uh, S Assembly Member Glick and State Senator Granardis have a bill which uh, allows for 750 cameras. The previous program allowed for 140 cameras. The bill they were considering last session was gonna double that, I believe, to 280 cameras. The bill that we did would have unlimited cameras. The advocates are on board for this bill of 750 cameras. So we are giving a home rule message and we are excited that the speed camera enforcement law uh, has been expanded significantly from what the state legislature had done in the past. We're gonna vote on the following pieces of legislation today. Today is a big day. We're doing a lot on lead paint. We are going to have the most comprehensive, uh, reaching, far-reaching lead laws in the United States of America with this package of bills today. So this is a big deal. Introduction 877A, sponsored by Council Member Cornegie, would require that certain city agencies provide materials regarding lead hazards, including information on how to obtain blood lead screening to parents or guardians of a child under seven years old uh, when those parents or guardians seek service from the covered agencies outlined in the legislation. Introduction 709, sponsored by Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, would require the Department of Environmental Protection to provide online an interactive map with information regarding known lead water service lines and to make best efforts to identify all lead water service lines, including privately owned service lines. It will also require that the department provide information to users about lead contamination prevention, lead water test kits, and how to replace lead service lines DEP will have to replace any known lead water service line that it owns by December 31st, 2025. Introduction 1063, sponsored by Council Member Holden, would require notice be given to a community board or to a local council member within five business days of discovering or becoming aware of a hazardous level of lead in soil. And I wanna introduce uh, Council Member Holden to come up. He actually had an incident about this in his, own, in his district. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for taking the lead on lead. Um, yes, we, we did have an incident. Uh, there was a sewer project, a water main uh, installation. They found, and this was back in November before I took office of 2017. They took the lead out of the ground. And they took the soil. The dump, the local dump, would not take it. In fact, no New York uh, State dump would take it. It had to go to New Jersey. But instead, the contractor, along with DDC, put it across from a school, PSIS, for six months, uncovered. So my bill will address that. That means, uh, by the way, DDC was telling me that the project was halted for six months because of ash. A 
apparently lead is a dirty word in New York City. Uh, they don't, they don't, they, they tried to cover it up by saying ash for six months. Finally, I had to track down where the soil was and of course, it was across from the school. So this bill requires, like, like the speaker said, five business days of discovering or becoming aware of the hazardous levels in lead, uh, lead in the soil. And it would actually require air monitoring uh, in that area. So we need transparency. And again, dumping it across from the school should not ever be tolerated. Dumping it any, anywhere near children, there's no levels of lead that are safe for, for anyone, and certainly children. So I want to thank Speaker Johnson. I want to uh, thank the chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, uh, Councilman Cosmetides, and all my colleagues who uh, signed on to the bill. Thank you so much. Thanks. Congratulations, Bob. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, 67 years in the making. 67 years in the making. <laughs> the first bill. Who's counting? Is it the first bill? Yeah, it's his first bill. Congratulations, Bob. Um, and we're going to go back. Councilmember Corning, you joined us. Uh, we talked about introduction 877A on having city agencies provide materials about children, how they could be affected by lead, so I want to invite him up to talk about his bill. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, as a father, I rise every day with the well-being of my six beautiful children at the forefront of my mind. In everything I do, I consider the impact my actions may have on their lives. Likewise, as a member of this council, I grapple every day with the very real challenges facing average New Yorkers and strive to create an environment that is more conducive to, health, to their health and well-being. In these dual roles, I'm particularly proud today to stand with my colleagues in the council to pass legislation that I believe will make an incredible impact on the lives of children throughout the city, including my Bill 877A, which will require all city agencies that serve children to provide information to families about how to obtain a blood level screening. As of today, New York City standards for blood level testing and what constitutes elevated blood levels lag behind what is now considered best practice. Since this body's passage of Local Law 1 in 2004, the CDC has updated their recommendations regarding what constitutes elevated blood lead levels in children, and, and HUD issued new guidelines lowering the department's blood, level, blood lead level thresholds to match the CDC's recommendations. Unfortunately, New York City and New York State did not adjust to those new recommendations. Today, that changes. After today, New York families will be protected by laws in line with the latest science related to blood lead levels. Our agencies will be required to enforce stricter and more clear, clearly defined thresholds to prevent lead level poisoning in New York's children. And finally, we'll be on course to eradicate the threat of lead poisoning to children throughout this city. Keeping our, keeping our children safe from the dangers of lead is paramount to providing them with the best opportunity to succeed in life. Updating the city's lead standards and providing additional and more thorough safeguards to ensure the children of this city are safe from lead poisoning is therefore a no-brainer. I look forward to the passage of this entire package of legislation. Along with my colleagues, I'd like to obviously thank Speaker Johnson for his leadership on this very important issue. Thank you again. That's Rob. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we are going to uh, look at introduction 1117A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lloyd Cumbo. And that would require certain city agencies to provide materials describing, among other things, building owners' responsibilities under uh, city-led laws. These agencies would also be required to inform parents or guardians that they can obtain, without cost or any payment, an inspection of their dwelling unit for peeling paint, a deteriorated subservice, or an underlying defect by calling through on one, and a lead t testing kit for drinking water from the Department of Environmental Protection. Unfortunately, Majority Leader Cumbo can't join us today, but I want to thank her for her work on this. And the next two bills are from Councilmember Danny Drum. Introduction 881A would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to establish an education and outreach program to increase awareness of childhood lead poisoning prevention. And introduction 464B. Now, this is a big one. This is uh, a really, really, I think, game-changing part of this package. This bill would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to investigate potential sources of elevated blood lead levels in children, including the inspection of any dwelling where a child with an elevated blood lead level spends 10 or more hours a week. 
This bill would also require building owners to investigate and remediate a lead hazard when a child spends 10 or more hours per week in one of their own units. This bill would also add an existing lead hazard remediation requirement for facilities providing daycare services, requiring them to post notices, describing any order to remediate a lead hazard and remediate such hazard within 21 days. Uh, Councilmember Drum will go into the details, but the reason why this bill is so important as part of this package is there are children who spend hours outside of their primary residence, their primary home, whether it's with their grandparents or their aunt or uncle or a friend of the family when they're getting childcare. Predominantly, these are lower income families who are using relatives or friends to babysit and, and watch the child. And in the past, laws didn't cover folks, children that were spending time outside of their primary residence and in a residence uh, that wasn't their primary residence. And this goes to fix that. There were direct cases of children getting lead poisoning outside of their primary residence. There was a court of appeals case on this, which is how Council Member Drum came up with this bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Council Member Holden said that you um, have um, taken the lead on lead. I will say that you have lead on lead. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Today, under the leadership of Speaker Johnson and Chairs Carnegie and Levine, the Council is moving ahead to address one of the most insidious public health crises of our city, the continued lead poisoning of children throughout the city. I am proud to have two bills as part of this significant package. Significantly, intro 464B will expand the definition of the term reside to cover cases where children become exposed to lead while spending extended time with a temporary caretaker. The Department of Health would be required to investigate the potential sources of elevated blood lead levels in children, including an, inspe an inspection of any dwelling where a child with an elevated blood level uh, spends 10 or more hours per week. This bill would also add to existing lead hazard remediation requirements for facilities providing daycare services, requiring them to post notices describing any order to remediate a lead hazard and to remediate such hazard within 21 days. Finally, this bill would hold building owners responsible to investigate and remediate lead hazards when a child spends 10 or more hours per week in one of their units. The second bill, intro 881A, addresses the distressing lack of public knowledge about lead paint hazards. This bill requires DOHMH to establish and implement an education and outreach program to increase awareness of childhood lead poisoning prevention. This program would be linguistically and culturally tailored to immigrant communities, especially those who have limited English proficiency. Families should not have to suffer through the pain of having a child exposed to lead and suffering the severe consequences. These bills fill a gap in the current code and as a result, protect New York's children from the myriad health risks associated with lead poisoning including irreversibly impairing neurological development, causing behavioral disorders, and reducing educational attainment. And, you know, I was a teacher, as I always say, for 25 years before I got elected to the council. Even just the littlest bit of lead can affect the child permanently for the rest of their life. So what we're doing here today is really, really helping and protecting children who are exposed to that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. Uh, next up, Introduction 918A, sponsored by Councilmember Richie Torres, would expand reporting requirements under the city's lead laws for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. The legislation would also strengthen the city's auditing of landlords to ensure compliance with their requirements under the city's lead laws. Again, this is another really important part. We had a hearing on this, on this entire package. There was very little auditing that was being done. Uh, even when there were people that were considered bad actors, when there were multiple violations, and we need auditing. So this talks about the auditing function of this requiring the city to audit uh, what's being done uh, with certain violations and uh, requiring a certain number of them. Uh, Richie can't be here today, but I want to thank him for this. Introduction 871A, sponsored by Councilmember Borelli, would require that any testing of water for lead that is required by law include a first draw sample from such source. You might remember a few years ago, there was a whole controversy related to school buildings where uh, there were elevated lead levels in the water, but they weren't doing the first draw test to actually get what the 
a real number probably should be in most instances. This would require that. I want to invite Joe up to talk about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Danny, and all the other members for passing uh, this important uh, piece of uh, important package of legislation. So I, I first became aware of this issue when uh, there were reports of about 35 schools uh, in, in broadly my district and, and roughly all of Staten Island who had elevated levels of lead. And of course, this was alarming to parents who had been sending their children to, to the school uh, with, with the sort of uh, implied knowledge that the water they were drinking every day was safe. Uh, this was bad enough, uh, and then it turns out that later that year, uh, the New York Times ran a headline saying, lead tests on New York City schools water may have masked scope of risk. And what they were talking about is the process of pre-stagnated flushing. Uh, what is pre-stagnated flushing? Well, it's basically running the water before you test it. So how long do you think New York City was able to run the water before they took a sample of what your kids were drinking? How long do you think it was? Let's take a test. Let's go right, right now and start. <laughs> Half hour. We're going to just do the time. 20 minutes. No, two hours. Wow. Two hours. According to the New York Times, every water outlet, every water outlet in every school was turned on fully for two hours the night before the samples were taken. So everything, every outlet, every toilet bowl, every water fountain was turned on for two hours and the system was flushed. And then, only then would the DOE uh, be able to test the water. And still, they found levels of lead that were inappropriate. That's key, they still found And levels. they still found le lead levels inappropriate. So this is something that the EPA has recommended uh, the DOE and other school districts not do since earlier than the school started doing this in 2016 or, or continued to do this in 2016. Uh, and now we are basically putting this uh, up to par with our standards in New York City. So uh, from the, the kids in my district, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the health chairman, uh, Traeger, uh, rather, Levine, uh, and everyone else involved. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Thank you. Uh, next, introduction 928, sponsored by Council Member Mark Traeger, and that would extend current requirements for daycare facilities operating in structures erected before January 1st, 1978, to other facilities serving children under six years old, including preschools, nursery schools, and elementary schools. Uh, Councilor Traeger is not with us today. An introduction 865A, which I sponsored, and it would reduce blood lead levels that trigger inspection and remediation requirements under the city's lead loss to five micrograms per deciliter. If the CDC lowers its reference below five micrograms per deciliter, the city's lead level will automatically go with that. It will match it in the future. Uh, that's not what the administrative code says right now. Uh, introduction 865A also dramatically lowers the definitions of lead paint and lead dust, which are particularly hazardous sources of lead contamination in children. I want to thank uh, our health chair, Mark Levine, for his work on this package. And just on this, on this bill, this is, all these bills are important, but this again, we are going to have the lowest, uh, we're going to have the lowest blood lead level triggering rate in the entire country. We're going to match the CDC and the EPA, what they recommended, were coming down in a significant way. So these laws here today that we are passing give us the most expansive, um, I think best laws as it relates to combating lead. Now the big issue and the big question is the city, the administration has to enforce the laws. We are only as good as the enforcement that we have in the past. Part of the reason why we did not end up being lead, lead free, uh, which we were supposed to, almost five years ago we were supposed to be lead free, was because of the lack of enforcement by city agencies, the Department of Buildings, Housing, Housing Preservation and Development, uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So you can write the best laws on the books, pass the best laws that exist. If you don't have proper enforcement, it's not going to make a big difference. The mayor committed, uh, I think about a month and a half ago, two months ago, at a press conference in the Bronx, uh, to making New York City lead free, to stepping up with additional enforcement uh, money and opportunities. So that's a very good thing. It aligns with this package of bills. I really, really want to thank the staff. They're here, Megan, Austin, and Zay. All of them have worked for months, if not years, on this package of legislation. They are super smart. They are amazing. They've done an incredible job. They've been led by Laura Popa and Jeff Baker. So I really want to thank them for their incredible work on this package of bills. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Jimmy, were you here? 
on the, no, okay. Um, so I'm happy to take uh, any questions on topic first, and then we can go off topic. Bridget. I think one of the things that has to happen is we have to have more regular oversight hearings. What came out of the hearing on this package of bills was the fact that city agencies were not coordinating with each other properly. You had landlords that had multiple violations that had not remediated apartments where children were being poisoned and they were not leading to fines, they were not leading to going to court against these landlords by the different agencies that are supposed to work together. I think the if there's any good thing that came out of um, all the tragedies that have occurred and the hearing that we had and the mayor's announcement is the fact that now I believe there is uh, an edict from the top that all of these agencies must work together in a coordinated fashion to enforce the existing laws that are on the books, but also we negotiated these bills with the administration with enforcement at the forefront of every conversation on these bills. So it's enforcement and then the council using our oversight capacity and responsibility with the relevant city agencies on a regular basis, whether it's through our annual budget hearings, which we're in the middle of right now, or it's additional hearings throughout the year to ask the questions that are needed to work with the advocates who know what's going on day in and day out on the ground and to get the information necessary to ensure that enforcement is happening. I think it's sort of a multi-pronged approach. So each one of these bills, they don't um, all totally align on the effective date. Um, some of the effective dates uh, take place in a shorter period of time. Some of them take place in a longer period of time. Some of the requirements actually become more stringent over time, uh, depending on what we find as we start to go through getting data and reporting. So I think when you talk about the, the package of bills we're doing today, we should be doing oversight throughout. I think the budget process uh, on an annual basis is a, good is a good opportunity to do that. Uh, our housing and buildings chair has been a real leader on this. And he, as he spoke about, being a father of five, six, uh, how could I forget? Uh, he, you know, he's passionate about this. So I'm sure he's gonna wanna have hearings on this on a regular basis. And we have to stay on top of these agencies. Anyone else on topic? Joe. Uh, I'm just curious, do you agree, it seems like the administration is both uh, budget for enforcement, but they, they want everything to be current, and it's very strange because they keep bringing up all 311, and that's what triggers the investigation, rather than trying to go and audit every landlord, because we don't know if there's rent in the, in the unit or not. Do you feel like that's sort of part of the way they go about uh, trying to find the right problem is budgeting? It's, I think, complicated. And it's complicated because we do want as many apartments as possible to be proactively inspected, um, where it's not the obligation of the tenant to proactively come forward to necessitate that inspection. But the number of apartments that are out there makes it almost impossible for the city through all of the different inspectors and enforcement agencies that exist and opportunities where you could do enforcement and you could inspect, whether it's upon vacancy of an apartment um, or if there's a through and one complaint in the building on one apartment, what does that mean for the other apartments in the building? And so I think in a perfect world, we would like every apartment to be proactively inspected. I'm just not sure that is realistic given the housing stock we have in New York City, the number of apartments that would need to be inspected, which is why we tried to do things to cover more apartments, like uh, Councilmember Drum's bill on the 10 hours, which is gonna protect more children. So I, I feel really good about this package of bills. We worked really closely with advocates um, who I think are excited about this. I mean, th I think their big, their big criticism 
is you can pass all the bills you want, but unless you have real enforcement, none of it really matters. And we agree with them on that because the previous uh, bills that were passed under, I think, then Speaker Gifford Miller, uh, a lot of those bills should have been enforced in a much more stringent and significant way, and they weren't. And I think that's what this process, the hearings on this bill, on these package of bills was able to expose in a significant way. And, and it's the, what the mayor enforced, Lead Free NYC, is supposed to be coordination among city agencies, greater enforcement, greater auditing, a multiple-pronged approach to get to remediating as many apartments as possible. Rich? Can you get your reaction to that two hours of flushing uh, the pipes before testing? What, what goes through your mind when you, when you heard that? I mean, I don't know if it's really a flare up. Well, I believe that was, that all came out in, I think it was the summer of 2016. And in, there are actually multiple schools in my district as well that saw extraordinarily high uh, lead levels in the water. And it's, it's crazy, it's indefensible, it's insane. And of course it's gonna scare parents when uh, you have elevated lead levels in water, which children go to the water fountain and use the water fountain or wash their hands or are getting a cup of water um, out of a sink. You know, it's very, very scary. And so we want to make sure that, first of all, they're doing remediation, but second, that we're getting an accurate number. Right In the past, they weren't even including that two-hour draw in the number. They were waiting until the two-hour draw was over, and then they were going back and then taking it. So you weren't even getting accurate numbers. This is going to give us a sense to get better, uh, accurate, more accurate numbers as this starts to happen. Anyone else on on lead? I want to call up Councilmember Van Bramer, who did have a bill. Yeah. I thought you did. I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak. Thank on you. It. I appreciate yeah. that. I realize uh, I thought you were asking me if I had spoken. Okay. But uh, uh, needless to say, I'm uh, uh, grateful for your support in the package, including uh, our intro 709. So we had parents come to me and my district wanting to know if we knew where uh, the water that their children were drinking uh, at their schools and in their parks were coming from, and uh, if we could identify uh, all of the lead water service lines in our district and in Queens. Uh, so uh, that's why we're really proud of this bill, which would require an unprecedented uh, depth and transparency in reporting uh, lead poisoning by creating an interactive map on the city's website to identify all known lead water service lines in New York City. Uh, the DEP would be required to create an accessible and searchable online map that would for the first time ever publicly report the locations of all known lead water service lines. Uh, that would include privately owned mains and service lines and individuals would be able to search by their address, uh, their zip code uh, and other identifying uh, locations. Uh, that would give them a level of comfort. Uh, the DEP would also be required to engage in outreach to educate the public on lead contamination prevention, lead water test kits, uh, and how to replace lead service lines. Making this data available and engaging in public outreach and education around this issue will better protect children and families from dangerous lead poisoning. So I want to thank uh, the staff uh, at the council, but also my staff, Matt Wallace and Jack Bernadovitz um, for their work on this, and thank the speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Before we go to off topic, I'm, I'm really proud of the council today. I think this is going to make a very big difference in the lives of many, many, many children who are not going to be poisoned now because of what we're doing, and we're now going to have the strongest uh, lead laws in the United States of America, and hopefully we can be a model for other municipalities and states around the country and in the federal government on what you can do to protect children. Uh, predominantly, <clears throat> the kids who have been affected by this have been uh, children of color and low-income communities, uh, and I think this is going to go a big way to as Danny said, save a lot of kids from being affected for the rest of their lives. So I'm really, really proud of the council today. Happy to go to, uh, Can I ask you sure, question? Jeff. Sorry for making it very late, but just wanted to know where you got those lead reference levels from. I mean, is it a team project or something else? 
on the the five micrograms per deciliter. Yeah, they have to be administered. And we just saw the numbers. Yeah. I'm happy to have the staff follow up with you. We worked with advocates, um, and it was, I mean, for me as a layman, it was very, very complicated to understand how you're measuring this and what the most effective way is. When you talk about dust, what's the most effective number when it comes to dust? When you talk about lead paint and when you're measuring for lead paint, what's the most effective uh, number there? When you're talking about water, what's the most effective number there? And so we worked with advocates, we worked with lawyers, we looked at what the EPA and the CDC were recommending, and we went through that entire process to try to come up with the uh, best standard possible while at the same time, a standard that made sense and that the city could enforce in a meaningful way. And that was a balance, but we still, even with that balance, are gonna have the strictest lead laws in the country. Uh, off topic, Juan Manuel. So on the first question, just because we open a case doesn't mean that anyone's guilty. Um, I have been, I'm not involved in the inner workings of the committee, but when it comes to me and they say, we've been told that this may have happened, someone filed a complaint, we saw something or heard of something which may have been inappropriate, I immediately say, send it to the committee. There's not, oh, let's try to work this out or figure it out. I think that's part of the reason why we've seen so many more referrals is I have said in any instance that's sent it to the committee, have the committee look at it. They may find something, they may not find something, but send it to the committee. They will look at it, they will interview people, they will do their due diligence, they will go through a process with due process, they'll interview witnesses, they'll do everything that they need to do in a professional way that protects complainants, but also protects council members in case there wasn't anything there. And so for me, I mean, each situation is different on its own. I have total confidence in Chair Matteo. He is a consummate professional. I think he's extraordinarily fair and impartial, and he takes these very, very seriously. And so I can't comment on the individual um, cases. Um, some of them may end up in a finding. Some of them may end up in no finding. And I think we get a sense of that sometimes up front, not always, but I still say send it to the committee. So for me, I think we're in a, I can only speak personally, for me, we are in an age and at a time that you have to get things looked at and checked out and that is the reason why I think there have been so many open cases because anytime anything has, has come to me, I've immediately said, send it to standards and ethics. Right away, don't delay anything, no one gets any special treatment, send it there. And I think that's the reason why you've seen so many of these cases. Again, some of them may pan out where there, there could be punishment. Um, the committee has to decide that and I'm not involved in deciding that, the committee is. Uh, I can comment on it after they make the recommendation and it becomes public, and some of them may mean nothing, but still we have to send it there so there's an investigation. On Mayor de Blasio going to New Hampshire, good luck. I mean, I, I think uh, he, uh, he's gonna find some Red Sox fans uh, in New Hampshire uh, because New Hampshire residents are Red Sox fans, and you know, growing up, I used to vacation in New Hampshire we would go for one week every summer to the White Mountains uh, in Lincoln, New Hampshire, Loon Mountain. So I love New Hampshire. Um, I've spent a lot of my 
childhood in New Hampshire. Uh, Jillian Jorgensen has regaled me with tales of Manchester, New Hampshire uh, during her time there. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen for the mayor. The mayor was in Iowa and South Carolina and now New Hampshire, and clearly he's very seriously exploring a run uh, for president. And, you know, that could uh, get more difficult for him as we get closer to the early caucus uh, and primary states when it becomes more intense because so much happens here on a day-to-day -day basis. But the good thing is at least New Hampshire is very close to here. It's like an hour flight, so it's not hard to get back in case something happens. Katie. Do you want to give a, um, some more information on the drive to the meeting you're going to, which is you're going to have a budget with the state sort of community funding sources? And yeah, so we're going to have a hearing on Thrive, and it's going to go through the normal budget process. Uh, we're going to, we had a hearing a couple weeks ago on Thrive, yeah. and we're going to have another hearing just through the budget process to look at how the money's being spent, look at what the plan is, look at the metrics that they're using, and have it just go through the normal budget process. So, you know, I've said I'm really grateful that the First Lady has taken this issue on. I think that to destigmatize talking about mental health and mental illness is a really important thing. But I also think we have to ensure that the huge amount of money that's involved here is going to uh, every type of person that needs it, and I especially am concerned about the seriously mentally ill, the severely mentally ill, the people that you see decompensating on our streets and on our subways on a daily basis, people that are schizophrenic, people that are physically not well, people that uh, clearly can't take care of themselves and are really vulnerable and in a horrible place on the streets of New York City or on the subways. And I think we, I can't speak for the entire body, but me, I wanna make sure that those folks, if we're spending such a huge amount of money, that those folks are gonna get the level of care that they need. And I saw yesterday through some reporting by Rosa Goldenson that what's happening on Rikers Island right now, I mean, uh, this is not new information, but there was more detailed information. I mean, Rikers Island has basically become a place for mentally ill people. I mean, mentally ill people, some of them have committed serious crimes, some of them have not committed serious crimes, but end up there because of a broken criminal justice system and a broken healthcare system where seriously mentally ill people are not getting the help that they need. And so this issue is a really important issue, which is why I'm glad the First Lady has really led on it, but we want to make sure that the money's being spent effectively. Rich. Jacob, do you know when the hearing is? March 26th. Yeah, so it's gonna, that, that hearing is the budget hearing, but it's gonna focus okay. in a significant way on Thrive. I don't know who's testifying. Uh, do we know, Jacob? Okay, I don't know who's testifying yet. Uh, I mean, it would be it, it would be great, and I, I mean this in a really welcoming way. I think that when the first lady's testified here in the past, she's spoken very eloquently and passionately about why she took this issue on. So she would be welcomed um, to come here, and we want to work with her on this because we think it's an important issue. Um, I know that Susan Herman, who used to be with the NYPD and was Deputy Commissioner for Collaborative Policing in her previous role, is now the Senior Advisor, and she was on Inside City Hall last night speaking to Errol Lewis about uh, the program and the metrics that are used, so I'm sure that Susan Herman will be here to talk about it, but the First Lady would be welcome because we want to work with her and collaborate with her on how to help people who are struggling with mental illness and mental health problems. Grace? I don't know how, I honestly don't know how we do that. I'm saying here that I, I invite her to come and I do it with an open hand. I do it in a spirit of collaboration. I do it in a way where I am passionate about this issue. I am someone who has family members who have struggled with serious mental health issues. I have friends that have struggled with serious mental health issues, so I'm really glad that she's taken this on. But at the same time, just like anything else, it has to go through the budget process. We have to look at the money. We have to make, we have to make sure it's being spent efficiently and effectively. And so we're gonna ask those questions, not in an adversarial way, but in a professional way that our oversight responsibilities and budget responsibilities 
responsibilities uh, require us to do. Yes. Yes. No, he's not resigning. I believe that was fun last week, Grace, with you. Um, uh, thanks for that. Um, uh, he is, I believe, resigning. I think you have to ask him. But my what I heard is he is resigning. I think the day before or the night before the election results get certified. And then the certification of the public advocate results are on Tuesday, the 19th, which means that if he resigned on the night of March 18th, there would then be the vacancy in his council seat. He would then be public advocate on the 19th when the results are certified. And then that would uh, necessitate a special election for his city council seat. So I am still the acting public advocate in the city of New York. Has he articulated formally that have him resigned over this meeting since he's not no, the no, acting public advocate? No, the, laws, uh, the, the rules of the council state that the speaker can designate anyone to uh, preside over the council uh, at any time, which is why in the past, uh, when then public advocate James wasn't here at certain meetings, Majority Leader Cumbo would step in. So no, nothing had to happen to make that happen. Joe? Um, do you think it's feasible to be mayor of New York City and the presidential candidate at the same time? I think it's very hard, because I think being mayor of New York City is probably one of the toughest jobs in the United States of America. Might be the toughest governmental job, governmental executive job, just after president. So. I think it would be hard, um, not impossible, but hard. Um, and there are certain things that happen in New York City every day that you would need to be present for if a tragedy struck, if a snowstorm hits, if something happens to a member of the NYPD or the FDNY, if there's a spike in crime, if, 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 uh, but also, Hopefully by a certain point, any mayor will have a team, a first deputy mayor and other folks that are able to hopefully ensure that operationally things are going well for the city on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't think any mayor individually manages the agencies. That goes to the deputy mayors and getting the right commissioners, but still whoever the mayor is needs to be here um, when certain things happen. And I think it would become more difficult as the campaign got closer to those early election primary and caucus states when you have to be there more often. So it's hard. Yes. Hi. What's your name? Uh, I'm Harriet. Hi, Harriet. Oh, great. Thank you for being here. There is no bigger champion, as any of us in the council know, for seniors in the uh, city of New York than Margaret Chin. Every year, she dubs it the year of the senior because she is fighting for seniors. And every year, I think this administration has, in, at least in their preliminary budget, fallen short on coming up with new monies and new programs uh, for seniors who are in need. The population of seniors is growing, of course, in New York City as uh, New Yorkers age and place, and we end up having uh, a, a greater senior population, and we have to make sure they have the programs that they need. This preliminary budget, I don't th think saw any new spending for the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, and I think that's what you heard uh, Chair Chin be furious about. She's been this way in previous years as well, and her advocacy has paid off. Well, we've gotten more money uh, for DIFTA because of her advocacy and leadership. Uh, so 
you know, they will go through the budget process. It's very early on. We're still in the preliminary budget, but I share her concerns. I've said that the lens I'm looking through um, this budget on is, of course, needing to have some greater fiscal prudence uh, as we're in a more difficult time, but also not balancing the budget or doing cuts in the back of the most vulnerable and hurting the social safety net in New York City. Yep, Joe. I, I've weighed in on it in the past extensively because it, it uh, one of the great local publications that covers my district on a week-to-week -week basis, The Villager, this has been something The Villager has been covering, I think, for five years on almost a weekly basis. And it is in Community Board 2, uh, which is a, a community board that Councilmember Chin and I uh, both share. Um, this is a project that's in her district. And if I spent my time as speaker commenting on what's happening in Councilmember Van Bramer's district on a local project, in Councilmember Drum's district, in Councilmember Holden's district. I mean, I, I, I would have nothing else to do but comment on local things in people's districts. Now, I do understand that people love this garden and that um, we also have a crisis as it relates to senior housing. There was a proposal to uh, use an empty lot in my district, a DEP site at Houston Street and Hudson Street, and to do a swap in some ways. For whatever reason, that was not able to happen. Um, <clears throat> and I know that the folks who have been advocating for the garden want the entire lot to be safe for the garden. I believe, again, because it's not in my district, just from what I've read in The Villager, that I think there's still 6,000 square feet of garden space in this new proposal. Um, so I know Council Merchant has spent a lot of time on this. I know the local community folks are really passionate about it and have been for a very long time. And this is one of the struggles that you see as it relates to people wanting more green space and the need for more affordable housing, especially senior affordable housing in New York City. Can I just do a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, the void section of it is also in the Yes. I just want to be uh, honest with you that I am not remembering all the specific details of the timeline, but I'll tell you that this came out of some really bad examples of how the zoning text was broken, especially, I believe, on the Upper West and Upper East Sides, where buildings were getting built two, three, four stories higher than needed just for mechanical voids that would then sit empty and people said this is no way to build or do city planning in the city. And I believe local advocates went to the borough president and to council members Rosenthal and Kalos and flagged the issue. And Raju Mann, our land use director, has been working on this issue with the borough president's office and with council member Rosenthal and council member Kalos for I think more than a year now. So we are, are the ones that I think, as you just said, Joe, we're the ones that have kind of pushed the envelope on this. We're the ones that went to, to the Department of City Planning and said we need to do something on this. We're the ones that have been privately really pushing hard to get something done here. Um, and I guess it's just because it came from local community folks who saw that there was a real problem here. Uh, who had I go to? Noah. No, I, I don't. I, I, no, I didn't see it. You want to tell me what it said? I <laughs> I disagree with him. Sexual harassment is a very serious thing. Every instance is different and case specific, but we have to make sure that people, especially women, feel protected and that they are not unfairly spoken to, touched, targeted in any way. 
And I think it's very apparent when you can tell the difference between someone just making an innocuous, normal comment to someone versus someone who says something that is inappropriate and uncomfortable and specific to that person in a way that could be construed or make that person feel like they're being harassed or discriminated against or met, meant to feel uncomfortable in a professional um, setting. So I don't agree with him. Jeff. I mean, I'm really excited that our congressional delegation is now in the majority and that they can hopefully deliver for the entire city and for the boroughs that they represent. Um, I have uh, always had um, great interactions with Congressman Meeks personally. We haven't been able to work on anything sort of governmental together. Um, there might be that opportunity uh, for his district in Southeast Queens. Um, but yeah, I don't know why anyone would want that job. Um, I think that's a difficult job to take. Uh, but, you know, uh, he and I have always had a nice relationship. I'm happy for him and for his family. They looked like it was a celebratory moment for them. His daughter, uh, Ebony Meeks, uh, works here, uh, and she's great. Um, she's a pro. She used to work for Speaker Hasty. She worked for Hillary Clinton. She's a wonderful, talented, great person. I believe his other daughter, I think, works in the controller's office as well. And I think he's been able to instill in his daughters a real sense of public service. And Ebony, I'm probably embarrassing her by saying this, but she is a star. She's amazing. She has totally done an incredible job in the year plus that she's been here. And so um, I'm happy for her. And I don't know why Greg would want this job, but he wanted it. Uh, Rich? Mr. Speaker, could you go over the uh, fee payment uh, uh, update you gave us and give us a sense of when you think this could be implemented if everything goes through on the same plan? I don't know when it will go through. I, I Unfortunately, I, um, I can get it for you, Rich, but I don't know what the effective date is for the state legislation. But we're passing a home rule message today, which they need to be able to pass Assemblymember Glick's bill and uh, Senator Gennardis's bill. Again, the original speed camera program was 140 cameras, which were operational in the previous iteration of the state author. I jump in here if I get any of this wrong. Uh, Kelly or Rob or anyone, Jeff. Uh, the previous uh, authorized program was 140 speed cameras. The proposal in the last legislative session was to double that to 290 speed cameras. What they're gonna do now is go way beyond what that proposal was to 750 speed cameras with greater hours of operation, which is good for the cameras, greater geographic flexibility for those cameras in school zones. So it's a much better bill. The advocates are on board for the bill who have worked so hard on this for years. Uh, and so we're really proud to pass this home rule message today which allows the state legislature to act on this. And I believe Assemblymember Glick said, I think I read it in Politico this morning, that Assemblymember Glick said that they think that the state legislature is gonna take this up in the next week or so. Uh, but I don't know what the effective date is. I think it'll probably be, hopefully, right away. But it's limited to school zones, right? Yes, but there becomes greater flexibility on how you, on how you define a school zone and the geographic distance from schools in a better way than existed in the previously authorized program in a way that advocates had asked for. But it's, so it's just school zones though. It's not just a random intersection that has no nexus to a school. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Jane Kelly from Brooklyn. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask about Hudson Yards passing the Texas Society. Oh, Hudson Yards. Sure. So, yeah, uh, the Eastern Rail Yards is opening up uh, this Friday. I actually think tomorrow they open up privately for <clears throat> the restaurant pavilion that they've created and the retail space they've created. 
Um, for folks that don't know, you know, Hudson Yards are the uh, MTA rail yards, both two rail yards, the Eastern Rail Yards, uh, which is uh, ends up being uh, east of 11th Avenue and the Western Rail Yards west of 11th Avenue. But they're opening up is the Eastern Rail Yards, which is 90% commercial and 10% residential, only one residential building. And that is going to finance the Western Rail Yards, which will be 90% residential and 10% commercial. There'll also be a 750 seat public school on the Western Rail Yard site. And so it's opening, it's been a project that's been going on for a very, very long time. The project came out of the previous mayor's proposed Olympic West Side Jet Stadium. And folks should remember, we very rarely get to talk about the PACB, the Public Authorities Control Board. I think the last time we've talked about the PACB in the state of New York in a significant way was around the proposed Olympic Jet Stadium. And then Assembly Speaker Shelley Silver's appointee to the Public Authorities Control Board voted to kill that deal. And so Hudson Yards came out of that jet stadium uh, being defeated, which I was against and the community organized against. That, uh, the, the Hudson Yards deal went through ULERP. It went through our prescribed land use process. It went through it for multiple years. Uh, and so I was on the community board at the time. The community board had issues but with what was proposed, but there were changes that were made along the way. Same thing with the borough president, who I believe was uh, Scott Stringer at that point. Uh, and the, my predecessor, Speaker Quinn, had issues, but there were changes. So went through a process where the community and elected officials were able to change the deal in a way that they thought made the deal better. Um, the subsidies involved, uh, I think, are different in some ways because um, we may want to take a look at them and see if they're still effective. Uh, but again, they were subsidies that went along with the public review process. Um, and you also got a seven train that was extended to that neighborhood. And a lot of that public money went to the seven train directly from city money. So um, I think it's more complicated than comparing it to what we've gone through with Amazon. Uh, again, I think we should take a fresh look at all these subsidies, at every single one of them, look at them, see what makes sense, see what doesn't make sense, talk to experts, see how many jobs are being created, see what the cost of the taxpayer is, what the return on that is, and have a conversation about all these subsidies. Um, but Amazon, I mean, sorry, uh, Hudson Yards, in my community, no one ever complains about Hudson Yards to me. Ever. I never hear anyone come up to me. I live in Chelsea. I'm in the neighborhood all the time. For the last 10 years since the ULERP was voted on in 2009, it, it wasn't talked about during my campaign for city council in 2013. It wasn't talked about during my reelection. No one ever asks about it. So I just think it's a very different situation and there's not, it's not really analogous to what we've seen with Amazon and all the questions that were asked. Bridget. Yes. Yeah, so the remaining proposals primarily, and, and jump in, Laura, if I'm wrong on this, or Jeff, if I'm wrong on this, the, the outstanding bills that we, what we are not voting on today, I think predominantly are related to soil and to water. Okay. So I think there was an issue that uh, the, the good intentions behind all of these bills, some of them were gonna have a very enormous cost associated with them without us knowing how many people we would actually protect. And so we're going through the process just to look at all these bills. Some of them may have merit where they'll move forward. Some of them may not, uh, but we feel really confident about the bills we're passing today. Any other questions? Thank you. Great, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you.